Here we go, more nonsense. Uh, review, uh, car oxygen, carbon dioxide, loading and unloading. Uh, using some graffiti here, here we go. Uh, we'll start off the idea again of an old icon that we've been using, or a mnemonic, whatever you want to call it. A little picture here in which this represents the circulatory system. And over here we have the pulmonary system. So there's the upper respiratory system, air is going in and out. There's the alveoli with the air inside. Of course, the purpose is to provide oxygen to the blood and to pull or allow the carbon dioxide to leave the blood. Uh, and on this side right here, we have the average hardworking cells which need the oxygen and create the carbon dioxide. Uh, again, the schematic right here is the circulatory system uh, with the left side of the heart pumping blood into the systemic arteries uh, over to the systemic capillaries and it drains back towards the right side of the heart and the systemic veins. From the right side of the heart, the blood is pumped into the pulmonary arteries, which goes to the pulmonary capillaries, and it drains back into the left side of the heart and the pulmonary veins. Uh, this being the pulmonary circuit, this being the systemic circuit, oxygenated blood in this region, deoxygenated blood in that region. And again, a reminder that the thing that allows the oxygen carbon dioxide to move here and here is diffusion. No pumps, no pores, no mechanisms, just plain old diffusion. It goes from greater to lesser concentration. Now, uh, let's look down at the bottom here at some things that we knew a long time ago and still do know, and that is that when it comes around to moving oxygen, some oxygen can dissolve inside the plasma, but only about 2% of the oxygen that moves through the blood actually moves through the plasma. A uh, majority of the oxygen uh, enters the red blood cell, combines with hemoglobin, comes oxyhemoglobin. So about 98% of the oxygen is being carried as oxyhemoglobin. Of course, this is what's happening in the area of the pulmonary capillaries, uh, in the area of the... Um, hard-working cells, you just reverse this stuff right here. So the oxyhemoglobin will fall apart, releasing the oxygen. Of course, the oxygen in the plasma is available for the cells also. On this side right here, the more complicated story of how do you move the carbon dioxide around. And on that one, it's a matter of, well, carbon dioxide can dissolve directly into the plasma, but that only represents about 7% of the carbon dioxide. Uh, carbon dioxide can enter a red blood cell combined with hemoglobin to make carbamine hemoglobin. And that represents about 20-23% of the um, carbon dioxide being moved through your system. Carbon dioxide can also combine with water to make carbonic acid. That can occur in the plasma, but it happens faster inside the red blood cells. So carbon dioxide can diffuse into the red blood cells combined with water under the influence of the enzyme carbonic anhydrase and you can make carbonic acid. The carbonic acid can then dissociate into H plus and HCO3 negative. The H plus, by the way, can combine with hemoglobin to make acetic hemoglobin. And acetic hemoglobin is more likely to uh, drop oxygen. <clears throat> so in a way, it helps to push any oxygen that was left on the hemoglobin. Now the bicarbonate right here, it's not gonna stay inside the red blood cell. Instead, it's gonna leave the red blood cell, become part of the plasma. But when this negative charge shifts outward, a negative charge shifts inward, and that's chlorine. So it's called the chlorine shift. When the chlorine moves in, as the bicarbonate moves out. Now, the reactions we've been talking about here are all reversible, and it's particularly important when it comes around to the carbon dioxide. With the oxygen, it's just a matter of, you know, the oxygen lets go, and so therefore it's available. But for the carbon dioxide, it's a matter of the bicarbonate from the plasma can get back inside the red blood cell, combined with the hydrogen ion, which comes right off the hemoglobin, and you can make uh, carbonic acid, and then it can dissociate into uh, H2O and CO2, and the CO2 is available then to diffuse out of the blood and into the airspace. Uh, likewise, the carbamine hemoglobin can dissociate and release the carbon dioxide, which can diffuse out of the cell and diffuse into the alveoli. And of course, any carbon dioxide that is dissolved, dissolved directly into the plasma can also dissolve out of the plasma and get into the air spaces. Uh, this strange little thing is sort of kind of down here. 
Uh, here we can see that carbon dioxide combined with water near the cells, where carbon dioxide is very, very abundant, and you make carbonic acid. The carbonic acid, again, can dissociate into H plus and HCO3 negative. Now, near the lungs, the bicarbonate and the H plus can come back together and make carbonic acid, which can then break down into uh, H2O, sorry about that, uh, and uh, carbon dioxide. That's inexcusable. Anyway, so, uh, and again, the carbon dioxide is now available. Now, this reaction can be rewritten over here, and we can talk about how things shift. So, carbon dioxide combines with water, makes carbonic acid. Carbonic acid dissociates into H plus and HCO3 negative. Now, this is a reversible reaction, so it can go this way or it can go that way. And in, as far as when does it go this way or that way, well, it has something to do with what's called a Chatier's principle which oversimplified says that the reactions shift towards a deficit or they shift away from an excess. So therefore, near the hardworking cells where there's an abundance of carbon dioxide, the equation tends to move in this direction right here, forming bicarbonate. However, in the lungs where there's a deficit of carbon dioxide, everything shifts in that direction right there. So again, it's Le Chatier's principle, it's just the idea that the reaction is reversible and it shifts away from the excess and towards the deficit. Now, the storyline uh, gets familiar when we talk about pulmonary precapillary sphincters. Pulmonary precapillary sphincters uh, respond to things such as oxygen level, pH, and carbon dioxide. And those conditions that cause pulmonary precapillary sphincters to open are these right here. And so the uh, blood will go towards where there's the good air, where there's a high oxygen and a high pH and the low carbon dioxide. Uh, it'll shut down and it won't go to where there's the bad air. So that's how pulmonary precapillary sphincters work. Please remember over here in the systemic circuit, it's very much the uh, opposite. Uh, here, you're shopping for oxygen. You're shopping for the good air. So you open the sphincters in the area where the air is good, high oxygen, low carbon dioxide. Over here, you're trying to deliver the oxygen to a place where it's needed. So things that cause systemic precapillary sphincters to open would be low oxygen, low pH, and high carbon dioxide. So those cause systemic precapillary sphincters to open. And the reverse causes systemic precapillary sphincters to close. So it's a matter of here, you're trying to find who needs the oxygen. Over here, you're trying to find who has the oxygen. Well, here are the general conditions that cause the pulmonary precapillary sphincters to open, the systemic precapillary sphincters to close. All these things work in wonderfully well when it comes around to what causes oxyhemoglobin formation and what causes oxyhemoglobin dissociation. So for oxyhemoglobin to form, you need to have a high concentration of oxygen, a high pH, a low concentration of hydrogen ions, a low concentration of carbon dioxide, and a lower temperature helps out too. Now these three characters right here kind of work together because the reason why you would have H plus in an an area or a high pH has to do with the uh, degree of carbon dioxide. Less carbon dioxide means less acid, which means a higher pH. These are the conditions that favor the loading of oxygen onto hemoglobin. So we'll get to that in a second. Over here, these are the conditions that favor the unloading of uh, oxygen from hemoglobin. And that would be an area where there is low oxygen, low pH, high H plus ion concentration, hydrogen ion concentration, high concentration of carbon dioxide and a higher temperature. And of course, these three right here play right off each other because where you have more carbon dioxide, you'll have acid and H plus is what acid is. And a low pH is the indicator of an acid environment. So these chemical conditions right here or these conditions, environmental conditions favor 
the uh, dissociation of oxyhemoglobin. These favor the association or formation of oxyhemoglobin. And notice that three of these characters are also part of the story of opening the pulmonary precapillary sphincters. And three of these characters have to do with opening the systemic precapillary sphincters.